Yeah, well, well said. Um, I like to shift this a little bit. Um, uh, you had mentioned earlier, um, I think as you mentioned, uh, uh, Khalil uh, Nias, I believe this is the name of a family member of uh, Sheikh Rahim Nias. So um, you, you had mentioned prior to us starting this particular uh, interview that you wanted to speak a little bit about Sheikh Ibrahim and Yats. And um, of course, a lot of people know who he is, especially if you follow the Tijani Tariqa. Uh, and a lot of uh, even Black Americans have come to know who he is, you know, but uh, for the sake of the, the audience, why don't you give us some uh, some background about who the Sheikh was? Yeah, so Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz. Yes. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him was a Senegalese West African scholar born 1900 in the Kaulak region of Senegal. Uh, his father was an anti-colonial warrior called Al-Haji Abdullah Nias. He was also a scholar. He was also a Qadi. He was a judge. He was also somebody that was traveled within the Muslim world. He left Senegal and he traveled to Morocco where he received some ijazat in knowledge and in tasawwuf. He traveled to Egypt, where he received some ijazat from the scholars of Al-Azhar. He traveled to Mecca, to Medina in the early 1900s, and he came back to Senegal. He was known for, you know, his knowledge of tafsir. He was also known for his jihad efforts against the French and his anti-colonial fighting, which led him to move to the Gambia, where Sheikh Ibrahim Nias grew up. So Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, even though he was born in Senegal, he spent the first 11 years of his life in the Gambia before returning to Senegal to complete his education with his father. And Sheikh Ibrahim was somebody of such immense knowledge and such immense spirituality. And the reason why I find him such an amazing figure was that even though he had no formal education in the sense that he didn't go to any of the major universities in the Islamic world. He wasn't an Azhar graduate or a Zaytuna graduate or a Karawin graduate or even a Timbuktu Sankore University graduate. Everything he learned, he learned with his father. And he said he never, after the day his father passed away, when he was 22 years old, Sheikh Ibrahim was 22 years old, he never studied with anybody after his father. But he was somebody that was recognized for his knowledge to such a level that he started to gather students from Mauritania in the early in his late 20s. And if you know the relationship between Senegal and Mauritania, there's scholars from Mauritania that when they go to Senegal, they don't even pray behind black people in Senegal, let alone to come and study with a Senegalese person because of the knowledge that they had. Uh, people who are from tribes such as the Dawa Ali and the Dawa Yaqub who traced their ancestry back to the family of the Prophet Sallallahu and were the people who spread Islam in the region were coming to study with Sheikh Ibrahim Nias in his village in the early 20s. Then in the 30s, he started to travel. He went on Hajj for the first time in 1937 after he established his own village, Medina, in 1930. And that's when he started to attract students from Nigeria, which we know in West Africa was the center of Islamic learning. The Emir of Kano met him on Hajj in 1937 and decided to become his student and invited him to Nigeria. The same thing with, um, not only did he meet the Emir of Kano, but he met prominent individuals such as Amin al Husseini, who became the Mufti of Palestine. He met Izzat Darwaza. He met all of these kind of influential people who were going to become influential in the Arab world. He met them during this Hajj. He met the royal family of Saudi Arabia, who were impressed with his knowledge as well. He gave a speech in front of King Fahad at the time, who, you know, invited him back as a guest of the king. And then in the 50s and the 60s, you start to see his influence expand more in West Africa. So from a Tariqa perspective, he was a Tijani and he practiced, you know, the Tijani Tariqa. And I think that's the lens that a lot of people look at him through. But for me, as a student of international relations and as a student of knowledge as well, I like to look at him through a different lens and through his international relations lens, which I find just as, if not more impressive. Because this is somebody that in the 50s and in the 60s, he's campaigning for the end of colonialism and he's working with people like Kwame Nkrumah, who are not even Muslim, to forward the, the, the advancement of Pan-African politics in West Africa mm -hmm. and uniting and causing the Muslims in Ghana to support Kwame Nkrumah's movement to, to allow Ghana to become independent. In Nigeria, he was involved in, you know, ending colonialism there and different disputes that were happening, the Biafra War, 
of these kind of things. He was involved politically. He was somebody that was involved in the Palestinian struggle. He was close to Hajj Amina Hussein. He traveled to Palestine a lot and he campaigned for the rights of Palestinians and he, rose aware he raised awareness for the Palestinian cause in West Africa. He was somebody that 1964, King, King Faisal uh, invited him to become one of the yeah. founding members and the vice president of the Muslim World League. And there were only seven founding members at the time. Chef Ibrahim Nyas was one of them. The Muslim World Congress in Pakistan with Maulana Maududi, he was a part of that. He even traveled to China in 1964 and he had a meeting with Zhao Enlai, who was the premier of communist China at that time. And they were talking about Islam in Africa and the different, you know, politics and global politics at a time when Senegal didn't even have a diplomatic mission in China. And this was all through his religious knowledge, his religious scholarship, and his religious diplomacy. This was somebody who traveled throughout Europe in the 60s. This was somebody who traveled to places that we didn't even know or hear about. There were places I didn't know about in the world until I read them in Sheikh Ibrahim Yassir's book that he traveled to through Dawa, through all these different things. And then he's somebody that has left such a major impact on the Muslim world in ways that we know and in ways that we don't know. So, for example... Recently, documents have come out about his involvement in helping the king of Morocco reestablish himself as the king after the French had exiled him to Madagascar. Sheikh Ibrahim was the only one given permission by the French government to visit King Hassan II, in, uh, Father Mohammed V in Madagascar, who was part of those kind of those um, diplomatic um, All of these different things that were happening. And then even if we look at scholarship in the world today, it's very interesting to note that, for example, in West Africa alone, the Mufti of Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh Husseini, was a student of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. I've sat with him many times here in Cairo. He has a house here. He has many students here. And he is somebody that he's a proud student of Sheikh Ibrahim. And not only that, but the Mufti of Chad is his student. He has a large following in Sudan as well. He has students across the Arab world in different places. All of that can be traced to Sheikh Ibrahim. Yes, it's Silsila. So I've seen, for example, Habib Ali go to visit Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh Hussein. He sit on the floor. Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh is sitting on the chair, teaching Hadith, giving them ijazat that come from Sheikh Ibrahim. I have a teacher myself, Muhammad Al Khamis Suleiman, who teaches in Darul Mustafa in Yemen. He's also taught in India and different places. He's a student of Sheikh Ibrahim Saleh Al Husseini, and he teaches the family of Habib Omar in in Tarim. And so you see like the circles of knowledge just outside of Tariqa, just in Fiqh, in Hadith, in all of these right. different, in Mauritania, one of the biggest scholars that we have in Mauritania called Muhammad Hassan Ul Ahmed Al Shadim. He was the person who gave Sheikh Hamza the ijaza for the book Purification of the Heart. And when Sheikh Hamza was studying, he studied it from his commentary. He's a student of one of the students of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, um, the Mufti of the chief Imam of Ghana, Sheikh Usman Sharbutu, was a student of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. In the Gambia, chief Imam of Gambia today, Imam Cherno Maska, his father was a student of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. Most of the royal families in northern Nigeria, all of these different places, you see the influence of his scholarship. And his, as one person to have affected thousands of people who go on to affect thousands of people, I feel as though that's a very, very important person for us to know yes, in Muslim right. history, so in Black history and African history, that there were mm -hmm. African scholars as late as 1975 who had impacted the world and continue to impact the world in that way. Um, and I feel like that's an underrepresented side of scholarship that is yes. deserves, to, deserves to be known. And just not looking at scholars from one angle. So for many people, right. even when you... Wikipedia and you type in Sheikh Ibrahim Yassir's name, the first thing that comes up is his, his, his uh, Sufi affiliate or his spiritual side. Nobody talks about his politics. Nobody talks about his scholarship. Nobody talks about his network of students. Nobody talks about his political oh, right. justice. And these are things that are just as important, if not more important than those things, mm -hmm. because they're just as relevant or even more relevant to modern society right. than right. the spiritual aspect. Because spirituality is meant to transform into you having the grounding to establish khilafah in the earth and to fight for justice in the earth and how your interaction, once you know Allah, then your interaction with the creation of Allah, how does that manifest? And so if we know that the tariqah and the spirituality is a path for you to know Allah, when you have that knowledge of Allah, how does that manifest in your actions? When you look at Sheikh Ibrahim's actions and how he dealt with 
global politics at the time and how he dealt with the Muslim world at the time and the issues that the Muslim world were facing. I feel like all of that is an interesting study, a case study, and how the authenticity of African scholarship was able to do that. This is somebody that studied right. in a small village in Senegal, but when he went to Al-Azhar, which was the center of Islamic learning in the Arab world, they allowed him not only to become a member of the board of the scholars of Al-Azhar, but he also was one of the first non-Azharis to lead Salatul Jummah in Al-Azhar Mosque in 1962, right. I believe. So mm -hmm. all of these things are right. aspects and more that I think need to be, you know, explored and spoken yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. And then being yeah. able to have the privilege to have studied with his children and his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I took Shahada with his grandson. I studied Quran with his granddaughter. I studied books with his with his sons, you know, and I've received mm -hmm. it from his sons. That's mm -hmm. something that I prize highly in my own spiritual development. Yeah.